Welcome everyone um, to the campus of Notre Dame. My name is Lou Nani. Thank you so much for carving time out of your busy schedules to, uh, to join us today for what I think will be a fascinating interview uh, with Ray Offenheiser, who I will introduce in, in just a couple moments. Um, today is Veterans Day, uh, so we all want to, uh, to pay our respects uh, to uh, those who have served uh, this country in the military, including uh, the two million uh, people who are currently serving in the military and the 240,000 military members who are deployed right now to uh, 150 different countries. Our prayers uh, are with uh, all of those military members and certainly their families uh, from whom many are estranged. And, uh, and it's just a great deal of gratitude. And when we think about God, country, Notre Dame, uh, the, the tie with uh, the U.S. Navy and uh, the armed forces here at Notre Dame. There's much to celebrate and, and be grateful for. A quick uh, COVID-19 update. Uh, there's been a lot in the news recently after the, uh, the huge uh, football victory against Clemson this past Saturday. Um, uh, much has been made about the, the storming of the, the, st the, the students um, immediately following the game. And, and I think much of that has been misconstrued. Um, Father John's concerns were not about that spontaneous and euphoric uh, charge on the field after the game. They had to do with some large off-campus parties that occurred that day prior to the game. And, uh, and, and that is something that has uh, been of great concern in terms of the, the spread of the virus. Uh, to be clear, uh, we tested the entire undergraduate student body via surveillance testing leading up to the Clemson game. And anybody who tested positive, many of whom were asymptomatic, were placed in either quarantine or isolation. So those students were not in attendance uh, at that game, unfortunately. Um, but, but everybody was tested in the student body except for those who had already uh, tested positive early in the semester. And, and had uh, you know some level of, of immunity. Um, we, 98% um, of the students complied and showed up for testing last week. And uh, it was so high because uh, if they did not show up for testing, it was made clear to them that uh, they would be denied admission uh, to the, the football game. And that proved to be uh, an excellent incentive. Um, now tomorrow we begin exit testing. Tomorrow is the final day of classes here on campus. Friday is a study day, as is the weekend, and then finals begin on Monday. So we will begin to systematically test every student um, before they return home uh, for the Thanksgiving holiday. And it's, um, it's important to note that Notre Dame will place a registration hold. They will not, if they do not show up for testing, and are not cleared uh, with a negative test, um, if they do not do that, they will not be able to register for classes uh, next semester. So we're taking this very seriously that we're not going to be sending students um, back to their, their home communities um, still infected or, or carrying the virus. So those uh, exit tests are going to be conducted uh, beginning tomorrow through the end of finals. Our seven day positivity rate uh, is currently at 5.9%, uh, which is higher than we would like it to be. Of course, we've conducted uh, to date this semester now over 70,000 uh, COVID tests. Um, locally in St. Joe County, uh, we have seen the rolling seven day average of positive cases um, has hit uh, 251 new cases per day, which is double uh, what we had seen uh, as a, a two-week uh, average just two weeks ago. So uh, there's been a significant up, uptick here in the community. Hospitals uh, with COVID patients are beyond capacity, um, but there's hope as we've seen the news recently that, uh, that uh, a vaccine um, may be on the horizon. And uh, there's hope that uh, maybe at some point next semester, uh, things will be in better stead. So that's a little update uh, uh, from the campus. And uh, it's, been, uh, it's been a challenging semester, but we're almost there till the end. 
And uh, with this cloud of COVID-19, there have been many, many silver linings. And I know the reason why we've made it this far is because first and foremost, the students wanna be here. They want in-person education and they wanna be here uh, with their fellow students. And that's what uh, has, has allowed us to get uh, this far. It's my pleasure now to introduce to you our special guest, and, and Ray Offenheiser. He is the William J. Pulte Director of the Pulte Institute for Global Development, which is part of the Keogh School uh, for Global Affairs uh, here on campus. Ray is a 1971 uh, Notre Dame grad. Uh, he returned to Notre Dame uh, in this capacity in 2017. Uh, he had served prior to this uh, 20 years as the uh, uh, president of Oxfam America, one of the world's leading uh, organizations in combating poverty uh, globally. And he did an admirable job, an admirable uh, job in, in that capacity. His specialties and focuses on international development and human rights and governance, humanitarianism and foreign assistance. Uh, he has provided guidance and wisdom to the World Economic Forum, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Gates Foundation, the Clinton Global Institute, our initiative, and, and many others. And we're thrilled uh, to have Ray join us today and uh, give us an update on the Pulte Institute and, uh, and some of his own uh, personal dealings. So Ray, let's start out. Why don't you share with us a little bit of your own Notre Dame story. Where did you grow up and how did you come to Notre Dame uh, back in uh, the late 1960s? Great, Lewis. Uh, great to be with you and, and with all of uh, um, our, our friends that are with us today on, uh, on for this uh, broadcast. Um, I suppose I could say my, my story is some getting to Notre Dame is somewhat serendipitous and, and um, I, uh, I come from a very big, despite my very German name, I come from a very big Irish Catholic family in, from New York City, and um, and I, my early earliest years were, were spent there in sort of the in kind of the heart of these very big Irish neighborhoods in in the city. But as it happened, um, my father was transferred to North Carolina when I was very very young, so I moved out of New York City to um, to North Carolina to Charlotte, uh, and um, and I suddenly found myself you know away from all of everything that was sort of Catholic around me, the parishes we belonged to, the, you know, the schools that my cousins mm -hmm. went to. And I'm suddenly in this, you know, the South in the 1950s, in the segregated South, um, the, the Confederate South, where the, where the Confederate flag was everywhere, where the Civil War was very alive for children. Um, I learned more about the Civil War in first and second grade than, than probably I would have learned in, in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. um, and. Um, and so suddenly I found myself in this, in this world that was um, going through tr rather substantial change. And I spent you know, most of my childhood there in, in the midst of the civil rights movement. I was, you know, Catholics at that time in North Carolina were I think less than one half of 1%. Uh, our schools were mission schools that were basically being, um, the teachers were basically nuns that came from Northern diocese down to do sort of mission work in the Carolinas. Um, and I, I kind of lived there during this period when the civil rights movement, you know, was getting underway. We had the Greensboro sit-ins. That was something that was very visible to us in the Carolinas. Um, Kennedy was elected president. So we had, you know, this debate about whether we, the country could elect a Catholic as president was, was, uh, an experience in North Carolina it was very different than probably I would have had it. I'd been in New York. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, and I was surrounded, I was living in a Southern Baptist culture and even, <laughs> Even kind of more amusingly, my um, I lived down the street from the farm that Billy Graham had grown up on when where, where his parents lived, and his and his sister was my next door neighbor, uh, and her husband was Leighton Ford, uh, who was Billy Graham's backup preacher mm -hmm. for the crusade. And so I like to joke that I I've heard more Billy Graham speeches probably than anybody you're ever going to meet because Leighton would play them on his tape recorder through the summer with the windows open. And so we'd listen to them over, over dinner at our dinner table. So I've, um, I sort of grew up in this, you know, as a Catholic in this very, um, in, this, in this world in which 
Catholics were actually in, in our own way discriminated against, but in sort of um, in, in various more subtle ways. So you had the sense of being, of, of what discrimination was like and being sort of a, a minority in a, in a majority culture that maybe was not necessarily all that welcoming to you. As it happened, um, and maybe, maybe just to sort of cap that, um, and this, the funny part is I didn't, I was less aware of the sort of this reality at the time, but I, become, I became more aware of the kind of implications of it later. As it happened, I started high school um, in the first high school, the integrated high school in North Carolina before the Civil Rights Act. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that had all sorts of implications because we, we would play sports events against other schools in the town. And I later learned from some of my teachers there at the time that one of the things that would all, always happen was that well, we were told when we went to games that if any fights broke out, you know, because of our African American players uh, were sort of being abused, we were to head to the buses and the buses would sort of take off and we'd sort of leave town quickly. Um, but also it was the case that we were told by the schools we were to play that um, if we showed up with our African American players um, that, that they wouldn't show up. Hmm. So interestingly enough in the schools that uh, the school that I went to we always made a point of showing up figuring if they didn't show up they forfeited and we would go have an undefeated season. So that was mm -hmm. the uh, that was the approach we took to dealing with <laughs> this problem. But um, but anyway, it just gives you a sense of sort of that that world, and um, and it wasn't a world I was prepared to sort of be a part of, but it but it wasn't, and it was a turbulent time to be there. Yeah. Um, but serendipity actually took me to um, for my senior year in high school to Philadelphia, where amusingly I ended up at Cardinal O'Hara High School. Now, all of you who have any association with Notre Dame know that there's a Cardinal O'Hara who is in the Basilica, who was a president of Notre Dame. And um, I did not know that at the time I ended up being in the school. Um, but as it happened, and when we moved to Philadelphia, I literally lived across the street from Villanova. So I spent all of my high school, you know, that last year of high school working on the Villanova campus. And all of my classmates at, uh, all of us at Cardinal O'Hara assumed, you know, we wanted to go to Villanova. Um, but I had a one particular professor who basically had been to Notre Dame as a, uh, as a student studying English literature, and he decided that I should go to Notre Dame, so he forced me to apply. I did, and, um, uh, and fortunately I got in. Uh, and, uh, you know, I went to, my brother went to Villanova, but I ended up going to Notre Dame, which was a happy, happy outcome. Fantastic, uh, that, that's, a, that's a great story. You know that uh, I learned, and, and I believe this to be true, um, although I'm never sure how accurate any of these stories are, that Cardinal O'Hara is buried in the Basilica um, and not with his fellow Holy Cross priests in, in, the, in the, the, the Holy Cross Cemetery on the road to St. Mary's because you must bury a cardinal above ground. Uh -huh. and, uh, and that's why his, uh, his, his tomb is, in, in, is raised there in one of the alcoves of the, of the Basilica. But tell, what did Notre Dame do, your four years here at Notre Dame, um, what did it do to shape this long-standing commitment to serve the poor and and to fight, uh, you know, uh, against uh, issues of poverty and injustice? Well, I, I arrived at Notre Dame in 1967, and you know, any of you that are on the on this uh, uh, call probably would remember that, um, and we're old enough, <laughs> would remember that the period from 1967 to say 71, which was my period, was a very turbulent time in the country because of both the civil rights movement and the, uh, and the Vietnam War were happening. And, and on campus, it was a very turbulent time on campus as well because of those, you know, all of those sort of factors going on around us at, at the moment. Did it occur, the 15 minute rule that Father Ted um, put in place for protest, did that occur during your tenure? Yes, my classmates were very central to that, okay. uh, that exercise. And there were a lot of other things that went on campus. The ROTC yeah. building was set on fire twice. There were draft card burnings in front of the library. There were all sorts of things that were happening. And there was a, whole, a lot of the Catholic, the Catholic community, the Berrigans and others who were sort of part of that period were living off campus, uh, coming through town and, and spending time in sort of doing sort of small teach-ins with students um, in the houses up and down Notre Dame Avenue. So it was, a, it was a time of really tremendous change in the country. For me, the, I think the, um, I think the advantage of being in Notre Dame at that time was actually had a lot to do with Father Hesburgh and how he handled that period, which, you know, it, I think one of the interesting statistics about Notre Dame that maybe we don't 
appreciate was during the, that period, there were only two college presidents that actually survived that period, Father Hesburgh and the president of Harvard. Most other ones resigned because the, 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 the campus, what was going on in campuses was so turbulent. Was that Derek Bach? Was he yeah, the president? Derek Bach was the other one. And he and Father mm -hmm. Ted were very close friends, I think, yeah. you know, over the years as a consequence. I later, I later here in Boston met um, a Derek Bach and had a really, really nice conversation about his relationship with Father Ted. Wow. But I think one of the things that was good about that period for, for students was that Father Ted was trying to model, um, you know, in interesting ways, what the university could do to kind of educate us about what was going on around us. So, for example, um, Martin Luther King came to campus and spoke in the Fieldhouse. Robert, Ralph Abernathy was on campus. Bayard Rustin, all the sort of the sort of the the major figures in the civil rights movement were on campus on a regular basis, and so you could see them and hear them and and learn you know a tremendous amount about the, the civil rights movement and what was going on and and what was the logic about you know not use of nonviolence is a basis for the protests in those in, in the civil rights movement. Um, and uh, interestingly enough. Um, the Peace Studies program, that is today the Kroc Institute, really happened and emerged at that time as a Peace Studies program, not as the Kroc Institute. Mm -hmm. but it started in the midst of that of that turmoil on campus, and and you know, with the inspiration of Father Ted, who brought some of the real great thinkers in the in the area of peace and um, the cat, the whole Christian tradition of sort of peace and justice, mm -hmm. brought them to campus at that time. Um, but there were also was a lot of the political figures that of that era. Robert Kennedy came to campus um, during that time, during the presidential campaign of that period, um, and spoke in Stephens Center. And I just remember being part of on the campus, shaking his hand as he went by, and a you know, in a standing up in a in the back of a, a limousine. Um, and then three months later, he was assassinated in Los Angeles. So you can sort of you know, it gives you a feeling for the the tenor of the times. But the real, I think, the real gift for me, for from Notre Dame, was that at the time there was a unusual program called the Committee on Academic Progress, and you could be nominated for that by a professor, um, and then go through a whole uh, elaborate sort of uh, exercise to become a part of it. And if you did, um, you ended up in a situation where you had a you had a unique advisor who kind of oversaw your academic program. You could develop your own major. You could get into any course in the university um, at any level, um, and you would give you, you were giving primacy of uh, 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 first right of refusal, mm -hmm. if I could put it that way, mm -hmm. to get into those courses. So I was I was um, fortunate to have uh, to, to make a connection uh, with the, uh, uh, Dr. Peter Walsh, mm -hmm. who was a South African political scientist and political economist who was on the who worked in the political out of the political science department. Um, and also headed an African studies program at the time. And so I became very interested in um, African you know, development in Africa. And, and as a consequence with him, he was an Oxford graduate. I ended up having more of an Oxford education at Notre Dame where I did lots of directed readings courses with him on international development. Mm -hmm. So my whole, I suppose you might say, direction of going into the field of international development was literally started at Notre Dame um, under the guidance of Peter Walsh. Um, and then I sort of graduated from Notre Dame with this question of, a very simple question, which was, now what do I do with this? Where do I go with this? How does one get started in a career, um, you know, with this as kind of a, a wish and a, maybe a kind of a direction, but not clarity about what does it mean to be, you know, right. a professional in the field of international development? Well, you've clearly found your way. I mean, your career, um, you know, in, in fighting poverty is... Uh, is um, is quite decorated and, and celebrated and, and you've had a huge impact. Let me ask you just a tangential question. When you look at the, the late 60s um, on a college campus and you look at, uh, you know, the civil rights movement and all of the racial unrest, the Vietnam War, all the protests and disruption on campus, and you look at what we're going through today, dealing with the pandemic, um, dealing with a, a crazy kind of uh, electoral cycle right now, and then also um, dealing with uh, all the kind of racial unrest that has resurfaced. resurfaced. Do you see comparisons? Um, does what we're going through today not even begin to compare uh, with what we went through in the, in the late 60s? How, have, you, have you thought about how those two, two eras compare? Well, I think the, I think the level of sort of... Um political division in the country is similar. And, mm -hmm. um, and the level of anxiety I think many many of us feel is probably 
very close to being the same. I think one of the big differences, and I actually spoke to a class at Notre Dame that was focusing on the sort of, you know, this 1960s and was in, it was doing a whole film project on this. And I it gave them some of this history, what it was like to be on the campus at that time. And I, I said, one of the interesting differences is um, that at the time we had the draft. Mm -hmm. And um, so every one of us who was a student at the time, and, and this was the still, the university at that time was all, still all male. Yeah. We had a draft card. And we knew that if we took a, a gap year, <laughs> which is now a common thing, we were going to go to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. We knew that if we fail, if we flunked out, we were going to go to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, we knew that if we made a mistake, we were going to go to Vietnam. And so, you know, it, that meant that every single male, um, irrespective of income level, color, race, ethnicity, was all had a draft card. Mm -hmm. So that meant that everybody knew that that there was a, you know, that that was a real possibility in your life. Yeah. And that kind of colored that kind of colored the the environment so that, um, you know, the at the time uh, I was at Notre Dame, we had actually my class had the first African American student body president. So we were so that was sort of an interesting kind of breakthrough at the university, but also the anti-war movement was largely you know white middle and upper middle class of people who were in the colleges. You know, they had the advantage of sort of being out on the streets. Right. Um, and so now think about it: we've been at war for 20 years in Afghanistan and in, in, in Iraq, but you don't see but but you don't see that same kind of politics around the war as you right. see around the civil rights movement. Right. So, um, so that's one of the major differences I, I kind of observed for the students. I said, if you had a draft, if you had a draft card when you came to here and you had the possibility of going to, you know, Iran, Iraq or Afghanistan, that would be very much on your mind. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So, yeah. I, so I think that's maybe the, maybe the big difference. But, but the civil rights questions, this discussion we're having now about civil rights is very much the kind of conversation we were having then. And, you know, and, and many of the dorms around campus Professors were going in at night and running teach-ins about, you know, trying to sort of educate students about civil rights. People were reading James Baldwin. People were, you know, reading Martin Luther King's, um, you know, books on the, you know, the Birmingham, you know, uh, you know bus boycott and so forth. Mm -hmm. So we knew all that stuff. But now we have, a, it's a different conversation, but it's an important conversation. And in that sense, I think it's very similar. I think that's fascinating to get your comparison of the two. Tell us about the Pulte Institute. <laughs> excuse me, for global development, and and in particular, what are some things in its short history that are happening now, and what is your vision for it going forward? Well, maybe just a little bit of background on this, sort of, the, I guess I could say, the origin story of the Pulte Institute. Um, and uh, so the Pulte Institute's now been around for about 10 years, um, but it began uh, as kind of an idea uh, that came out of Notre Dame uh, research. And the, the premise was, um, uh, I think at the time, I think Father John and, and, and I think earlier Monk Loy and Father John had really wanted the university to begin to think about becoming more global. Mm -hmm. And so the idea was, you know, we need to make a number of investments around the university to try to move that agenda forward. And so um, today we have Notre Dame International, which w runs all of the international student programs. But one of the other investments was in creating something called the Initiative for Global Development out of Notre Dame Research. And the idea there was to promote interdisciplinary research across all the faculty, schools, and colleges within the university to actually um, get faculty working together to look at complex contemporary global problems. And so that was the that was the idea. And then, and so we existed initially inside Notre Dame Research, and our role was in some sense to convene the faculty around interesting opportunities and proposals and begin to, in some sense, raise money um, through grants um, that we could get to support faculty that had interests uh, in global problem solving. And so that's how we got started. And we got started very modestly. But the interesting thing was at the time, the university had not really pursued much in the way of grant funding for this kind of work. So we started off very modestly with a grant here and there. Um, and over time, with support from many, many donors in the Notre Dame community, we grew. We, you know, we, we built a sort of a small, you know, a small endowment fund to kind of keep ourselves going. But we became more and more successful in securing grants from um, foundations, from um, federal government agencies, and from even from corporations for doing you know, a variety of different things. One of the things was basically training of um, uh, tra running training programs of, of different sorts. So for example, we have 
a training program called the Mandela Fellows Program, which in which we train 30 or 30 to 35 young African leaders every summer with support from the State Department uh, as part of a national program. And they come to campus and, um, and we collaborate with Mendoza and, and offering uh, a variety of different courses and training uh, initiatives for them. Uh, we've trained 150 people from 36 countries now over about five or six years that we've run that. We've just got a renewal of, of funding for that program from the State Department. We also have done, um, one of the other things we began to do very well is because we have research capability, we began to build a program to do evaluations of very large USAID government programs overseas. And we've become very, very skilled and successful at that. And we've recruited staff who are a combination of researchers and also former practitioners like myself who kind of know the development field and know what the important questions are. So we've been doing, we've been evaluating a lot of, uh, of uh, different AID programs. Can you give an example of one? Well, for example, um, well, one of the things that we've done in, um, in um, Haiti is we've been working on a, a large program um, to introduce uh, a literacy program in Haiti. And there, you know, AID have been doing a variety of different kinds of experiments with, you know, where should we be, make investments in the education field? And we were, there was a grant proposal where it was thought that we could perhaps work, that somewhat should work with the Catholic education system. And so we combined with ACE on campus, which is the group that works on Catholic education. And we put in a proposal for this and we started out, you know, modestly working, um, trying to introduce a literacy program in 47 Catholic schools in Haiti, basically focusing on the first three grades with the, with the idea of, you know, building kind of reading and writing capability in the Catholic school system. In Haiti, the school system, public school system is very poor. And so AID decided basically after the kind of evaluation I'm talking about that basically making a bet on the Catholic system might actually even help the public school system. So the idea was start modestly with this program, evaluate the outcomes, and then with the idea that it would be scaled up to maybe a thousand schools around, the Catholic schools around the country. And the training program for teachers we developed for the Catholic school teachers, we could then transfer into the Ministry of Education in Haiti and actually affect the public school system as well. <clears throat> so therefore you're getting the kind of systemic change that you wanna have that's gonna have long-term durable right. effects. And has that been successful? That's been not only successful, we just got renewal of, uh, of, of a grant for that for another you know, um, several million dollars to actually continue that for another three or four years. That's and great. expand it and add some new dimensions to it. That's great. What are some of the other, um, as you say, global problem solving initiatives that in the first 10 years you've embarked on that, uh, that make you feel uh, most satisfied, proud? Uh, well, we've, we've worked on sort of a, uh, you know, S South Sudan, for example, is a, um, is a very, as a country, is a new country, actually, yeah. uh, in Africa. Basically, it was created um, when uh, Sudan was divided effectively in two, and it's been undergone a, tr you know, a tremendous amount of turmoil and conflict over the last number of years. And um, in, in that particular country, again, on, in the education area, UNICEF has taken a big lead for within the UN system. And they run, you know, they have a lot of experience running education programs all over the world. Um, but the particular challenge in, in, um, in a country like uh, South Sudan was how do you run this in a country that's still un undergoing some degree of conflict and focus on children, try to keep them in, in some form of uh, school and also deal with their, their, their basic educational needs as well as their, what you might call social, psychosocial needs. And so they developed a very interesting program in that area. And so we've been working with them in evaluating the impacts of that program all over South Sudan and, uh, and uh, trying to figure out how to build that out and in some ways do the same things we've been doing in Haiti, try to determine what, a what aspects of that in those interventions have been successful and what, other, you know, what, ones might, what other kinds of interventions might need to be introduced in the future to improve that program and also to take it to scale. Because a lot of these issues um, you know, can't be addressed on, you know, in one community, you need to really think about a system that's actually going to support the, the idea at the core of your program, mm -hmm. but then take it, as I said, in Haiti to a thousand different schools, which makes it, you know, gives it more durability and actually, you know, spreads the benefits much more widely. One of the things we often say around here, Ray, is that 6% of the world's population roughly has a college degree. And how are we making ourselves relevant to the other 94% of the world's population. You and the Pulte Institute through the Keogh School are clearly doing this in some of um, the, the neediest and most desperate regions, countries in the world. 
about a year ago, you received this amazing gift uh, in the name of Bill Pulte. And you, as you mentioned, received several other gifts, but this gift helped you to endow the directorship, to endow the Institute. Um, tell us a little bit about that gift and how that has elevated the impact of the Pulte Institute. Yeah, well, yes. Well, um, well, let me first acknowledge that, you know, as I said earlier, that when we were in the Initiative for Global Development, there were a variety of other donors who actually contributed in those early days to kind of get us up and going and actually position us to become an endowed institute. Mm -hmm. But I will say that the Pulte Institute gift for us has been a game changer um, because it allowed us to kind of consolidate our, our um, organizational infrastructure, if you will. I mean, one of the big changes that has occurred with us is that you may you, you said it in the beginning, but maybe just to underline for the for the listeners, we moved from Notre Dame Research when the uh, into the Keogh School for Global Affairs. So when we did that, we ended up getting a whole new mandate in in the sense that we now were becoming an institute within a school, with not just a role of raising money and convening faculty to to um, pursue research on global issues. But to do that in the context of a school where we had a pedagogical role and we have a role on in developing a, the policy identity for the school. So that was an exciting transition for us that happened literally in 2017 and literally when I arrived, which was one of the reasons I was excited to arrive because I thought that prospect was really gonna be transformative of the university. Um, the Pulte gift I think for us has allowed us to consolidate you know, our work um, and give, you've given us, you know, I think significant momentum. It's also provided us with a lot of exposure within the university. I think a lot of folks didn't know we were there and didn't know what we could offer them in terms of support for that faculty that wanted to get grants. We could support them uh, in developing the proposals and actually uh, managing the grants once they're, sec they're secured so, they, so the researchers can focus on the research problems and not on the grants administration. Um, we can help them conceptualize these things. And so all of a sudden we've got, we're getting more demand from Notre Dame faculty who wanna work on global issues and who wanna work collaboratively, which is on an interdisciplinary basis, which is really the, was the core premise of Notre Dame research in the, in the first place. Um, it's also enabled us to do things that Notre Dame had not done before in the international space, which is join consortium with other universities. So for example, we are part of a $70 million research grant that we received uh, to, in a proposal that we developed together with uh, colleagues at Purdue and Inter Indiana University. That capability of being able to work with you know, skilled and, and, and capable faculty from other universities in our own state has proven to be very, very valuable. And we've subsequently done that with um, universities in Arizona um, and other universities uh, in other parts of the country where you know, we have complementary skills and they see the advantage of working with us, we see the advantage of working with them. We've also built a network of organization, uh, organizational relationships around the world. We have there's something like 375 partners, uh, institutional partners in probably about 60 different countries across the globe. Um, so in some sense, I like to think of us as becoming Notre Dame's bridge to the world uh -huh. and, and, and a bridge from those institutions in those 60 countries into Notre Dame. Uh -huh. um, because every proposal we put forward now, um, one of the presumptions that the funders have now is you know, northern-based institutions should no longer be the sole drivers of the development discussion, that they should be partnering with, com com uh, with institutions in the nas nations where they're working so that there's ownership of those programs by the people living in those countries. So having all these partnerships um, and being able to bring the intellectual capabilities and technical um, knowledge of the Notre Dame campus and all the data processing and analytics that we have, bring that to the world through um, uh, the capacity that the Pulte Institute provides us um, is great. So we've, you know, been able to grow our staff to now from, I think uh, we started, well, I think when I came, we might've been 14, 14, now we're 28 uh, mm -hmm. staff um, with strong research and international development experience. So um, I think it's, and, and, and um, I think subsequent to receiving the grant from the Pulte's, I think we've, we, we've probably, the return on investment has been quite significant, you know, being a part of the $70 million grant and another $40 million one, which I think I think is one of the largest uh, grants in the history of Notre Dame that where we're the primary grant manager, that $40 million USA grant that we re recently received, which is for basically working um, uh, with universities or, you know, around the world on doing research on educational performance. So our work in Haiti and our work in South Sudan has identified us as a, as a campus that has expertise in early childhood education. So now we're able to get more grants in that domain. 
So, Fantastic, um, and obviously have greater impact. What makes the the Pulte Institute at Notre Dame uh, in the Keough School? What makes it distinct, unique? How is it different than at other universities and, and at other NGOs? Well, I think I, I, first of all, I think I, I well, I think I've said to you, I think on occasion, Lou, that I think my my perception was that you know we had in the Keough School we have nine institutes that represent mm -hmm. different issues. Some of them are regionally focused on Europe and Ireland. Um, and then we have two large institutes, the Kroc Institute, which is the, you know, is the, is about peace building and peace studies. And we have the Kellogg Institute, which is, um, uh, about democracy and governance. Um, and, but, we, but in the whole field of international development, in terms of thinking about that and thinking about poverty and inequality issues as kind of a core of what the Institute's about, that's kind of what we're, where we're adding value. And I felt really passionate about that because in some sense that's what I've given my life to. And I felt that Notre Dame has always had that as a kind of a core premise for our identity. Mm -hmm. um, and yet we didn't have necessarily the vehicle that enabled us to be outside the university in a very practical way, doing practical work on, on problem solving and, and engaging in policy debates in Washington and in the UN and around the world. And now we really have that on poverty and inequality issues. And there's much more potential to build that out into the future. Mm -hmm. So what maybe maybe final questions here? Um, what is your vision? How do, how do you take uh, the Pulte Institute to the next level? Um, what do you see foresee its uh, its impact being? How big is the vision? Well, what we what we've done is we built we've built a strategic plan which you can find online at the at the uh, Pulte Institute website. And basically, our premise was that we should probably focus on four or five basic sort of aspects of sort of problem sets that affect poor people around the world. Mm -hmm. And um, and so what, what are those? Um, one of them is basically this whole issue of sustainable development. In other words, how do we live within the biophysical limits of this planet in a way that allows us to sort of secure resources and ensure that people around the world, you know, whether we're, you know, from wealthy countries or poor countries are able to sustain a decent livelihood. How do we manage that sustainable development sort of um, uh, exercise of, uh, of living, living sensibly within the limits of our planet. Um, how do we think about global health issues? I mean, in the midst of this pandemic, we, we can sort of imagine, you know, that the importance of public health, but many, many countries around the world don't even have the minimal basic health system that would actually even enable them to deal with a pandemic at this scale. And we oh. saw that in the Ebola affected countries a few years ago. So that, that that's an area that we're, you know, that we're, we give attention. The whole issue of good governance, and um, I guess I could underline from, you know, having lived overseas for many years that, you know, the importance of institutions and quality institutions and quality leadership of institutions and the way they're governed um, are things we take for granted. And when institutions aren't governed well, you get corruption and you get misuse of funds and you get, you know, you get poor outcomes. And so, so that's an issue that's of, of central concern to us. Um, humanitarianism. We're living in a we're living in a world in which you know today there are 23 million people starving in Yemen, for example. In Syria, we know what happened in Syria, and we saw the massive you know outpouring of of population migrating to Europe and elsewhere. The humanitarian crisis around the world today. There's you know there's scores of this the few that we know about, and there's many that we don't that don't make the news cycle. Mm -hmm. um, so this is an area where, um, uh, if we care about human suffering um, in the global context, we should be giving attention to how we can do that work better. Mm -hmm. um, the UN system is very interested in thinking about a new ways of doing humanitarian work, and so we want to be part of that. And then the final piece is about what I guess I'd call the role of business and markets in development. Mm -hmm. Today, um, unlike when I started in this field, um, the private sector and, and global markets and global corporations are in countries all over the world that they really were not in basically 40 or 50 years ago. And foreign direct investment in many poor countries used to be 100% from foreign aid and say 5% from you know, private capital. Today, it's the inverse. Mm -hmm. Basically today, it's 90% you know, you know, foreign direct investment from private capital and 10% and foreign aid. So the question is, you know, what role can business play in alleviating poverty and addressing some of the you know, the needs of the, of the more marginalized populations around the world. So these are the kind of five issues we're working on. And then the question is, how do we build out our capabilities in these areas? How do we collaborate with faculty around the university that are interested in these topics? Mm -hmm. um, the university itself has a major commitment to sustainability. So 
there are faculties, there's undergraduate education programs, there's other you know, people we can work with. <clears throat> there's a very skilled group of faculty that work on water issues that's very central to the sustainability topic. So some of the talent we have right around us and our, amongst our colleagues, we can, we can assemble and convene them, which is what we were set up to do, be the convener. And then secondly, we can begin to recruit some new faculty in to kind of enrich the, this new school of global affairs and make it more powerful and more and, and have more impact in the wider world. And um, that's gonna gain us platforms in Washington, it's gonna gain us platforms in New York at the UN and platforms in international fora on diverse, on some of these topics that I just mentioned. Well, fantastic. Any final thoughts, Ray, anything that you've not had uh, uh, a chance to share with our, our listeners that, uh, that you think would be um, good to share? Well, first I just wanna say, um, I'm very excited to be at Notre Dame at this time because I think what we're doing <clears throat> within the Keogh School is, um, I think it's sort of a capstone to a great to a great university's history of wanting to be in the world. And this is, uh, I think the Keogh School is, is well positioned to play an important role for Notre Dame to be in the world in, in very practical ways <clears throat> that in the past was, were difficult for us to do. And maybe just a few things that I've learned from the you know, in the development field over the years that I think we're trying to convey to students. What are we trying to, what's the gift we're trying to give to students that is important about the kind of this world, this global context? One, that the whole issue of international development and, and global affairs is complicated. Mm -hmm. You know, not, no one discipline can solve these issues. So you've got, to, you've got to be working with people in groups and in teams and on an interdisciplinary basis. Each place we work has been my experience is unique. So we have to appreciate context and we've got to be sensitive about culture and we've got to be taking advantage of the resources of the university to convey that. We've got to rethink poverty. You know, we haven't done it. We haven't done well in addressing the issue of poverty. And in my own experience, I came to think of it in a different way. Sometimes we think about poverty as the absence of a public good. People don't have a school, we give them a school. But the reality is, we can ask a different question, which is why don't they have the school? Why is the state not providing the school? And in which case, poverty may be more about social exclusion and about institutions and about policy than it is about necessarily the absence of that single school. So we need to think about new approaches to addressing poverty. We need to think about building institutions and the importance of institutions. And we need to think about development maybe in terms of the ownership of the people that we're trying to assist. They're not beneficiaries, they are owners of their own destiny. And so how do we work with them in a different way with a different kind of ethics? How do we accompany them, which is the word that we use here at Notre Dame? Mm -hmm. um, and how do we build moral leadership? In other words, I say to the students, you know, every one of you that goes out and does this kind of work is a practical ethicist because everything you're dealing with is a moral problem in the way resources are going to be distributed. And so you should think of yourself as a practical ethicist in the world. And then finally, I think we give them the gift of integral human development and Catholic social teaching, which gives them the moral foundation to be a very special kind of professional that, um, that uh, um, are gonna be the difference makers in thinking through these hard problems from a moral perspective. So maybe I'd just leave you with that as a final thought. That's fantastic, Ray. Well, you certainly bring that uh, that Catholic perspective and that professionalism and a load of experience to to our students and our faculty and to the partners um, beyond the university, uh, both other universities as well as NGOs. Um, that uh, that is hopefully going to allow us to have a greater and greater impact on solving issues of poverty and and. Uh, and neglect around the world. So we're, we're incredibly grateful uh, for your leadership and the work of your team. We understand how vitally important it is and, uh, and consonant with the mission of a Catholic university like Notre Dame. So thank you. Thanks, Lou. I would just say uh, I'm very excited to be here and um, I'm grateful for the gift of being able to give back. Fantastic. Well, um, uh, we uh, will come together again next week, next Wednesday. Uh, which will, uh, uh, it will be the kind of closing of the semester. Um, but as we always do, whether you're in your workplace or at home, uh, please join us as uh, we'll close with, uh, with a Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Take care, God bless, thank you, and go Irish. Thanks again, Ray. It was a pleasure.